Hi Floss Tube. It's been such a long time. I've been out of town on an adventure and I've really missed watching all of you and connecting with you. So I'm excited to be back. I'm trying to catch up on all the episodes that I've missed. It's kind of hard after being gone for two weeks, but believe me, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I see it all. So I entitled this episode Flags and Ships and Stitching Trips because I got to go on a fabulous stitching trip and I'd hoped to do a video before I left, but I just couldn't pull it together. So if you're new to my channel, this is a channel about cross stitch, quilts, antique notions, mostly from the 1800s, textiles from that time period, any history that's relevant. I just tie it all together and it's all in this big soup pot of trivia. So stick around and welcome back. And my name, if I didn't tell you, is Susan and this is Susan Stanley Stitch in Time. So I was so privileged to get to go help a friend who was teaching at the Needle Arts Seminar on Mackinac Island in Michigan. And I'd never been there before, and it was so magical. It's an island off the Huron Lake, Lake Huron. So it's right next to Lake Michigan, and there's the Mackinac Bridge, and there's this little island. You have to get there by ferry. And the only mode of transportation on the island is horse-drawn carriage. So we stayed at the Grand Hotel. That's where the Needle Arts Seminar took place. I might pop some pictures in at the end. I, I brought a pamphlet to show you, but it doesn't, it doesn't do it justice. I think I'll pop some pictures in at the end. Not too many, I won't bore you. But if you ever get a chance to visit there, if you live on that side of the country, it's really, really special. Um, anyway, but I wasn't there for the scenery, although I enjoyed that very much. I was there to help her with this needle art seminar. And the needle art seminar has been going on for several years now, and it includes punch needle, knitting. I don't know if they've had cross stitch stitch stitchers there. Um, rug hooking, quilting, embroidery, you name it. And in the hotel gift shop, there are actually projects that you can do that kind of center around the island motifs and the hotel motifs in all these different needle and thread and floss um, kits. And I don't know, it was just really fun. And I met some people from the Seattle area there. I met some people from uh, the Texas area where I used to live. So I, it was just delightful. And it was, I was out and around other stitchers and that's always fun. So I did wanna, do a little bit of um, clarification and catch up on a few things before I move into my, my goodies I have to share with you today. So the first thing I want to tell you was I did get the book, A Perfect Red. I had, I wasn't sure, I didn't know anything about it. I had only read the review. I didn't realize it, it is not historical fiction. It is a nonfiction book. It's so written so well though, you feel like you're reading something it's very entertaining I found so and incredibly informational I mean the woman has done awesome research if you enjoy the floss tube discussion I did last time about the color red and you like history and you want to know a little bit more uh, I highly recommend this I had a couple people tell me they found it as an audiobook I think that's an excellent option for the ability to keep stitching. I am unfortunately the kind of person that likes to underline and take notes, so I really have to just hold the book and read it. So anyway, highly recommend it. Wasn't sure, it's spot on. Um, next thing I want to tell you, <laughs> I had so many technical difficulties last time, but uh, I tried to correct all my errors and edits, edit things. I was having to film every 10 minutes and then download it and then film 10 more minutes. I was quite jangling. I'm hoping this time goes better. 
Anyway, so apparently I did not correct myself when I was talking about red and I said that green, I said that opposite the color wheel was violet. Anyway, so opposite red on the color wheel is green and it is red is between violet and orange. Just in case anybody was confused, a couple people commented on that. Thank you for helping me. It's hard. Any of you who've done this, you know, watching yourself is horrible and then editing yourself is harder. And then when you have technical difficulties, it just, oh, anyway, but it's so fun. And I appreciate everyone who does floss tube. I appreciate everyone who watches and comments. It's uh, such an, a wonderful connection. Seriously, I've connected with people all over and I, I can't tell you how much I value that. So, and as a result of that last video, or I think maybe as the result of the first video, I had a lovely lady person reach out to me and ask if she could send me um, a copy of a children's book. And I, I have collected children's books centered around quilts for years, but she sent me a book that really relates to um, something I talked about in my very first video and also that I'm going to talk about this time, but it's called The Oxcart Man. It's uh, written by, a, it's a Caldecott Medal Award winner. It's, a, it's just a lovely, charming children's book about the seasons of New England and farming and trade and product production. But the the main reason she sent the book to me was the Oxcart man and his family would work all year to gather supplies to take to market and he would sell things at market and he would buy things at market and one of the things that he bought at market was an embroidery needle for his daughter. And it had come to the on a boat in the harbor all the way from England. And anyway, I just she thought of me when she read that. I think she was a former school teacher. And later on in the book, it talks about after spring had passed and he had done his market transactions, the wife, his wife and daughter are cozy in the home. She's spinning the flax that he purchased and the daughter's stitching away. And it was just a lovely book. And thank you so very, very much for thinking of me and now I have a new thing to collect which is books that talk about needlework notions um, and things, textile production, anything along those lines. So anyway, and then she sent me um, an article that she got from Piecework Magazine, their um, newsletter. And so I quickly ran over and joined the newsletter and great, great information it talks all about, this article happens to talk about pins and needles and how, you know, money was saved for the purchase of pins and they were treasures. Anyway, thank you so much for thinking of me and I love, I love being able to share this with the rest of you so you can, you can join the fun and find out about that. I'm going to grab my glasses. I really, everything's fuzzy. All right. Okay, next thing, I had several people ask me about the uh, applique quilt that I'm working on called Civil War Bride or Lost Boy or Bird of Paradise, several names for that quilt. And there are two patterns available for that book. One of them is a book that uh, is very hard to find, and I'm so sorry, I didn't realize it was out of print. Uh, but I did find out, however, and that's that was published in, in the States, and the name of the person who wrote it is escaping me, but I will put it in my show notes at the bottom so you can keep looking the secondary market and see if it pops up. However, if you want the Threadbare version, which is uh, from a lovely quilt shop in Castlemaine, Victoria in Australia. You can order it through Sentimental Stitches and I will put the information below for that because she she has 
contracted with them to be able to provide it in the United States. And it comes in these big envelopes and the sheets are in full page format. And it's, it's beautiful and it's her rendition of the quilt. Each pattern is a tiny bit different. The border is, is done a tiny bit differently. Um, so if you're hunting and hunting for that, sentimental stitches can help you out. I've also had people ask me what applique technique I use and I started out learning back basting and then I and then I moved into needle turn and then I really explored every technique out there. Actually, that's not true. I did start out with raw edge blanket stitch. That was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I find it really helpful to have a lot of tools in your belt. So I, I have used the Appliquick technique, I've used the starch technique, and I really like the starch technique pre, where you pre um, prepare your edges before you stitch them down for leaves and things where you're going to have a lot of the same image over and over and over again. You want them to be consistent or at least close to the same. So. I hope that answers your question. Maybe sometime I'll do some kind of a applique many ways tutorial if there's interest, but there are so many great appliqueers out there and so many tutorials available and classes. Um, I just say get every tool under your belt that you can and you'll find that making bias strips with a bias maker for certain stems works, but it doesn't for others. I just, anyway, so I'm not, I can't say that there's just one technique under my belt. I like them all for a different purpose. Um, and then I also had someone ask, what is, what is, what is the reproduction? What does that mean? What is, what's that all about? And so, as you know, if you've watched my videos, I love, repro I love things from the 1800s, the early 1800s especially. I like to reproduce them and make them feel that old-timey feel because they make me happy in my home and I just, you know, it's just what I like. So I think if you think about reproducing on a continuum, you could think from reproducing something, any artifact or any antique, you can reproduce it and pull it off as a forgery because your reproduction is so spot on. No one can tell that it's not old. And that's, that's one type of reproducing. You would actually gather in the sense of needlework or in quilting, you would gather old pieces of fabric, old threads, old everything and reproduce it using the old techniques. Okay. I've done a little bit of that and that's fun. I'm not trying to pawn them off as forgeries and it's probably pretty obvious they're not forgeries, but I'm trying to, I have tried to reproduce things exactly from using the old materials. Then I, then I find it way more practical to reproduce something using new fabrics that are reproduced to look like the old, of course. Uh, so many fabulous designers out there. I've talked about Judy Rothermel, whose hanging is behind me. Um, I've talked about Betsy Chechen. There's just Barbara Brackman. There's designers out there reproducing fabric from antique quilts. And if you really like that hunt and that search of reproducing an old quilt and making it look just like the old original, um, those those fabric lines are great. Um, then you Then you can move from doing that kind of a reproduction into an adaptation of an antique quilt. So for example, the Dear Jane quilt I showed early on, that has been reproduced very, very much exactly like the original, matching fabrics to the original as close as you can based on the current market. But then there have been people who have taken that pattern and they've reproduced it or they've adapted it and made it using batiks and completely different genre of fabric. And that is another step along the continuum. So 
I say, just like with samplers, I say do what you love and do what you want to have hanging in your home and what brings you joy to look at after you're done. If the if the sampler or the quilt has a color in it and it's just not making you happy, sometimes it's worth it to try it because just that little pop or whatever will just add a lot of interest to your project. But if it's just really not making you happy and you want to mute it down or, or jazz it up, do it because this is your time, your energy and your effort and it's your expression of yourself in, through your art. So. I hope that answers that question. Um, I'm sure we could have a huge long discussion. And I'm, again, you know, I'm not like some famous historian. I'm just talking off of the top of my experience and um, what, I've, what I've come to formulate my thoughts in my own head based on my own experience. All right, so it's just interesting to me how things roll around and I, the workshop I went to at the Needle Arts Seminar in, on Mackinac Island, um, I was helping a friend, so I was there helping her set up, tear down, bringing her lunch, she was teaching. But during the off time when she was teaching, I have taken her classes previously, I was able to take two workshops by Maggie Benonomy. And it's just so interesting because I came back and Carol Saltbox Stitcher is heavily involved in uh, a new a new project that Maggie has put out. Um, Lisa Primson Greenway did a beautiful rendition of one of Maggie's patterns using um, paper, and it's gorgeous. And she framed it. And then Laura, I think from Brenda and the Serial Starter, is also kind of diving into Maggie Benonami's work. And Maggie is um, she's an artist truly, and she does primitive folk art design and her work is very relaxed and she uses a lot of wool and this time on the project that I that I did with her she also incorporated cotton and actually some antique swatches of fabric which of course completely floated my boat and made me super excited so I'm going to share with the those with you but another question I had received um, before I left, based on my last video, was what is primitive and what is folk art? Like, you know, people are confused about what does that mean. And I, I think I answered it, you know, in a very simple way. I thought, well, I'm going to ask Maggie because, you know, this is really what she does. And she actually said to me, I told her, you know, someone had asked me and she said, well, what did you say? And I said, well, primitive to me is the complete opposite of formal. Formal, you have an educated mind, you have educated skills, you have technique that, you know, you're trying to make it look as realistic as possible. And to me, primitive is maybe more untrained. It's just the common folk using the common materials and interpreting things the way that they see them in their daily lives, like possibly um, that's why we see on samplers, you know, these humongous cats next to this teeny tiny person or this, uh, you know, huge house with a, a teeny tiny bird or a huge bird on a teeny house, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, I'm going to show you some of the, some of the project, the projects that I worked on with her and a couple of her resources. If you're interested in exploring what she does, she she does um, mostly work with wool. And so doing super fussy applique and sometimes cross stitch. Cross stitch I find extremely relaxing. But this is even more relaxing if you can imagine that because you're stitching through wool, which is like just sticking a knife into butter. It's just so easy and smooth. And basically you can't make your stitches incorrectly or too big or too small or too close together or too far apart because it's folk art and it's meant to not be perfect. So the first project that we worked on was called Escape, I'm sorry, The Folded Sewing Necessity. And that's the cover of it. And that's the inside. 
and this is actually a padded pin cushion. So this is how far I've gotten. I have to stitch down my S's there, one just fell off. And it's all on linen and cotton with wool, and it's basically just whip stitched. Here's the inside, and this is velvet. And all the velvet and linen and wool is hand dyed by Blackberry Primitive Designs. And I will link that below as well. The most yummy, delicious, beautiful colors you could imagine. Uh, I'm looking forward to finishing this. All I have to do is I, I do have to square it up. I can't just leave it wonky. You know, there's certain, everybody has a level like some people some people were doing beautiful stitching that they had learned on it and and it's gorgeous but I thought you know what I'm just going to summon my inner eight-year-old and just stitch this and get it on there and I love I love the imperfection of it all right so that was one project and that was that was an exclusive to this seminar. So she does have fabulous patterns and projects available on Blackberry Primitives and through her books, which I will show you and I will link all the books below too. I don't know. I think they're all available still. All right. The next project was called Trip to the Island. And it was her representation of Mackinac Island. This is the pattern. This is what it's going to look like when it's done. And so the wings. Okay, so I'll show you what I have so far. Things are just basted on and I've started stitching it down. So I'll have more to show you next time on that. And then I wanted to show you something that I did in 2013, actually. It's one of Maggie's projects. It's named differently in her book. I'll just hold it up here, but I'm going to insert a picture because I can't really get the full, the full thing <laughs> on the screen. It is from her book called With These Hands. And this is what the original looks like. And I dated mine eight, uh, 2013. She also has cross stitch pattern. This, all her books are wonderful. Um, I would, I would recommend getting all of them, but that's just me. Her other, let's see there. I think there, I'm missing one, but her, one of her other books is called Buttonwood Farm. A Day at Sunnybrook. And these are taken, the pictures are taken in her home. She has an old home uh, that she's restored. This one is pure and simple. So. I'll insert a picture here of my quilt. All right, so the title of this is Flags and Ships, and so far we've only seen one ship on my project with one teeny tiny flag. But 
I wanted to show you some of the projects that I have going on and I have to thank the Lancashire Stitcher for help, helping me discover this chart. I had because you know it's almost Memorial Day and it's almost Fourth of July and so there's a lot of patriotic American holidays coming up. I thought it'd be really fun to stitch this and it's huge and I've probably bitten off way more than I can chew but what I love about this chart for me uh, and if you're not an American it may not mean as much to you but each state is listed in the stripes and it, they are listed in the order that they were adopted into the Union. And it's called One Nation. So I changed the linen a tiny bit. It's not the called for. I have this so far. Actually, it's upside down. And it's 400 stitches across by 200 or something along those lines. It's huge. Absolutely huge. So. And what I'm doing, because I didn't, I wasn't able to get enough of the Cupid, I'm combining one strand of the DMC DMC 816 and one strand of Cupid. And I'm really pleased with how it looks. I'll show you, show it to you again. And because I was feeling so good, I love the blue. I was able to get the call for Michael's Navy. I was not happy with the call for white because I had changed the linen. It didn't look good. So, and I'm just really have a hard time making the white lay nicely and look good. So, I love Shabby Sheep, but it's an awful lot, it's classic color works, it's an awful lot like the linen, but I thought if I pulled one strand of Shabby Sheep with one strand of Toasted Marshmallow, because this is over two, this is on 32 count, and it is called... Parsons Gray by Legacy Linen, and I'm sorry, it's 30 count. Parsons Gray by Legacy Linen. Sorry. And so anyway, I'm being creative because uh, I, I'm just having a hard time accessing supplies. But I'll show that to you again so you can get a little bit of a, an idea of how it's going to look. And you can, you can probably tell where I did two strands of the DMC and then switched to one strand, I'm sorry, two strands of the toasted marshmallow. But I'm really pleased with how the red looks. And I think overall it's gonna be fine. So I just have a tiny start on that. And I plan to keep stitching that through the summer. I'm trying to come up with a routine for my stitching that is not completely emotionally based because I'm a pretty emotionally based crafter, stitcher. <laughs> I stitch what I feel like stitching at the moment. And so as you can see, I have quite a few projects in many different realms going on. So that's my big um, flag project that I really don't have any other flag cross stitches going on, but there are so many fantastic patriotic um, cross stitches out there. I mean, just a ton. And I, I love to reproduce, but this, t this time I'm kind of, I love to reproduce antiques, but this time I'm, I'm just doing things that really have some, another meaning to me. I wanted to show you a quilt that I'm working on that has that flag theme. Actually, I finished this quilt and this quilt, um, the flag portion is, well, let me show you the quilt and then I'll tell you the story behind it. So, okay, it's upside down. All right, so. I'll 
I'll take a I'll take a picture and and do a close-up because it's really I'm sorry it's just really hard to hold up a quilt with the camera so close but the flag in the center is from a laundry basket quilt pattern called Made in the USA. It's a downloadable and it's a great, it's a good beginner project if you're just jumping into quilting or want something, you know, easy to work on. I think it would be really neat to do flags of the states or if you're, you know, obviously you could adapt this to whatever flag your represents your country. But so that project, the reason I'm doing that project is because of a fantastic quilter on Instagram named Jenny Bear, and her Instagram account is called Tossed But Not Sunk. And she's in Australia, and she has graciously allowed me, this was kind of her creation, and I saw it and I thought, I'm gonna make my own version of it. I loved it. And so she, I asked her if she was okay with me you know, making my own version of it and and then also asked her if I could share it on Instagram and, and on YouTube and she's ab said absolutely. Um, she's got lovely quilts if you want to check her out. I'll link her below as well. Anyway, so she had done that quilt and as you noticed, um, it's surrounded by ships, which I'll talk about the ships later, but I just thought it was really fun and scrappy and I loved the, the flag in the center. Um, the ships are actually from her fabric line that she, that Judy, from a fabric line that Judy Rothamel produced in honor of the, in remembrance of the 400th year of the Mayflower Crossing. And I thought that was neat and significant. So I bought the fabric, but I wasn't really sure what to do with it. And I really loved what she did with it. So that's pretty neat. And then I wanted to show you one that I'm hoping to do down the road. This is also a downloadable. It's by Minnick and Simpson. It's called, they're calling it Christmas Past, but I really think if I changed some of the colors and made this look more like red, white, and blue flag, I would, I would really like it for all, for the patriotic holidays because it reminds me an awful lot of this quilt that was produced in 1855 by Martha Hewitt. I just think it's stunning. Absolutely stunning. It's pieced in appliqued. She was in Michigan uh, when, she, when she made it. She's got detail soldiers. The colors are just stunt striking and it is actually at the American Hurrah Antiques collection in New York City and I'd love to see it someday. So those those kind of inspired me that and then this one. Oh and if you're interested I, I'm not trying to endorse books but if you're interested this book is Quilt Masterpieces by Susan, Susanna Pfeiffer, and I'll link that below too. Just some really beautiful quilts in there. And then another one that I, I kind of am drawn to, and I think someone has reproduced or adapted, is this 4th of July quilt called Stars and Stripes. I love the one next to it too, but. And that is in the Smithsonian Treasury American quilts. So that's kind of my my flag portion. And so then that leads into the, the ship. And I had to take a ferry over to the island when I went on my trip. And the ox cart man had to wait for the ships from England to arrive to bring supplies. 
And the Judy Rothermill fabric has that fa fabulous Mayflower ship on it. Um, and my, my sister-in-law is doing a bunch of family genealogy, and she said my husband's family did not come over on the original Mayflower, but they came over on the second ship called the Mayflower. So there were two Mayflower ships. This is all according to her research, so I don't haven't verified any of it. But I do see ship motifs pop up in quilts and in samplers, and of course, ships are just, they've been around forever, almost. And before mechanization, that was how things were passed around the world. That's how you got supplies. And I can just imagine a child or a family or anybody waiting and for the supplies to come on a ship. And our, we can kind of relate because we've had such slow time this year getting product delivered. So when I think of ships, I think of this image. I just love it. It's N.C. Wyeth. And it's a picture of his son that he that he painted. And I just think of childhood imagination and exploration and going to lands unknown and discovering uncharted territory. So in art, boats and ships typically represent a journey or a crossing or an adventure or some kind of an exploration. They also represent femininity and kind of the aspect of the, the sheltering mother, you're protected in the boat, in the ship, kind of, it's your cradle. So, I mean, you can think of all the nursery rhymes that really talk about ships and all the um, wink and blinking and nod sailing off away into slumberland. And so, of course, that fabulous Judy Rothermel fabric um, spurred a whole bunch of ideas in my mind, but uh, another th another quilty ship I want to share with you is a representation of a ship that's early. It's from 1897, and it's not doesn't really look totally like a ship, but this block is called Ships at Sea, right here, and this little quilt is. A quilt from a quilt book by um, a great, a fabulous designer and a friend of mine, Betsy Chutchen. It's from the book Hope's Journey. And in the book, she and the the little this little doll quilt's called Setting Sail. And in the book, I love this book because she has little tidbits of history noted. And so this is the first chapter, Setting Sail. She talks about, oddly enough, the Mayflower. Um, anyway, just it's just a great book. So I wanted to show you that too. So then, of course, as I, of course, had to do some research on ships in samplers, and there are several ship motifs in samplers, and Ships also can relate and were used to represent mourning, mourning in the sense of somebody passing. And on the Massachusetts Historical website, Society website, which I highly encourage you to go check out, there's this sampler pictured with a ship off in the distance. So they're at a, a a sarcophagus, I believe that's what that is, and they're mourning the passing of someone, and there's this ship sailing away. And so according to Betty Ring, who is kind of the scholar in the um, cross-stitch sampler realm, as far as what things mean and all sorts of history, Morning samplers, like the one I just showed you, came into vogue after 1800, and they were inspired by memorials produced upon the death of George Washington. And so I think I find that interesting, that ship motif. And so then, of course, I had to look at samplers with ships, and I thought, you know, with my husband's connection or 
possible probable connection to uh, the early colonists. I had to get this one. So and it's got the Mayflower. So that's my that's my fun. And this is so I know I know this is old. I know a lot of you already have this, but I just thought it was so neat. It comes with so many little fun goodies. This little needle minder. Anyway, so that's my connection to ships. And then I want to show you an antique sampler that I have that has a ship on it. Someday, I hope I can reproduce this. This antique sampler is from 1806. It's by Elizabeth Hartle. And I say Elizabeth was a confident young lady because her name is about as big as most of the motifs on the sampler. But there are two ships in the middle or canal boats or barges. I'm not really sure. I, I know Elizabeth is from the UK, but I don't know anything about her. I have not researched her yet. So possibly when I find out more about her and where she lived, if I can find that out, I hope I can, I'll know more about these ships and their significance. I do know that the poem or the, the sentiment at the top relates to death. And when I first looked at these ships or these boats, it remind, they reminded me of the Greek mythology where the departed person is carried across the river, sticks in a boat to the, to the eternal home. And so, I don't know, I mean, would a, I think this was done by a child, would a child represent that in their needlework? Maybe. Um, it's not an uncommon sentiment, but this little piece my friend may have, when I am dead and in my grave, when greedy worm shall feed on me, my name here under you may see. I don't know. Anyway, I thought you'd enjoy seeing that. More on that to come. Okay, now haul. I have quite a bit of new product that I have acquired. And I guess it's because it's been quite a while since I've filmed. So I thought this was lovely from Modern Folk Embroidery. I love the idea of always having a red work in progress. And I thought this was a neat shape. And so I downloaded this from Modern Folk Embroidery's website. Not sure when I'll start it, but that was a new acquisition. I love, love, love this. I had ordered this uh, when I was researching motifs with children. And this is a boy and a girl, I believe, because it's called George and Hannah Ashmore. And I'm not sure how you can tell because they both look like they're wearing the same type of outfit to me, but if you have any input, let me know. I would love to know. I just love it. It's a needle pocket or some kind of a antique pouch. It's from Needlework Press and it came with all the DMC. I got this from Traditional Stitches. So it took a little bit of time to get here and that's why I didn't show it to you when I was talking about the children. This one, I think a lot of you have, but I love it. Cottage Sampler Pin Keep by Stacy Stacey Nash. Mary Clayton by Hands Across the Sea. I guess I'm feeling the need to have some charts in my collection. And honestly, I feel like charts in some ways are almost like having a book and they're just 
really fun to look at and maybe I'll stitch them and maybe they'll just be in my collection but they, they bring me joy for sure. So Isabella Johnstone and then I know a lot of you are, are working on this one or going to work on this one. Caroline Amelia Travel. Love it. And then lovely Rebecca from Hedgerow Stitching came out with Jane Thwaites. And then I got I got most of the threads. Still waiting on the linen. Her second one. Anne Rollinson, 1845. Love, love a simple, just charming marking sampler. And then, I don't know, I think there is a sew along. There are so many sew alongs going on. I want to do them all, but I'm trying to have some self control. This one I love anyway, so I got it. Joan Sands, 1839, also by Modern Folk Embroidery. Love those carnations around the border and those colors. And then my latest cross stitch book, In the Neatest Manner, The Making of the Virginia Sampler Tradition. This is by Kimberly Smith Ivy. Lovely pictures, some in color, some in black and white. The coffin boxes, which I've recently been learning more about. Information on each sampler and some stories, not and some stories about the area specific and a few stories about people and possibly stitchers. So I have a lot of reading to do. I was gifted by my lovely family some wonderful scissors for Mother's Day. And they have a lot of significance. They are Saju, but they have, of course, for Saju, but you know, S and SS for Susan Stanley. So, yeah, they were. And they, they snip your threads beautifully. They're mother of pearl, they're gorgeous. Don't need them, but I loved them. I love them and I'm very, very grateful to have them. And then the last thing I want to show you is something I picked up in Michigan at a little flea market. It's a little antique doll quilt. It's probably from the 30s. The backing fabric is definitely 1930s. I'm typically drawn to things from the 1800s, but I loved it. It was so sweet. And I probably will do a separate video just to talk about this at some point, but I was pretty thrilled to get it. All right, and now it's time for a giveaway because amazingly, I have 2,000 fabulous subscribers and more. And I'm so grateful for, to you. And it's just motivating because to keep doing this when you know people are enjoying it. So what I want to give away today is this book with a block of the month style quilt that you can work on and 12 doll quilts that you can make. So this is a brand new copy. I want to give you a charm pack of this fabric by three sisters called Martinique. And I want to give you this lovely little hanger, which I think would be great for a doll quilt 
or a small cross stitch project that you don't want to that you maybe just want to back and you don't want to make into a pin keep to hang up okay so for that let's use the word hope in your comment you need to be 18 or over you need to be a subscriber and don't say anything about giveaway in your comment and when I get ready to upload my next video, I will use the random comment picker. And then after that, the, the giveaway will be over. So if I've pr produced a video beyond this one, the giveaway's over. I hope that's clear. Okay. All right, we made it through and I didn't have to keep stopping. So that's a good thing. Um, thank you again for joining me, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Bye.